Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Join believers from around the globe to study the Bible with Andrew Womack and instructors from Karis Bible College. Hello and good morning. I want to welcome you to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. My name is Julianne Harris and I will be your hostess this morning. This is an interactive Bible study and we want you to interact with us. So how you do that is whatever form you're watching, as you have questions enter into your heart and your mind, we want those questions from you. So go down to the chat section, type in those questions, and then the last 10 to 15 minutes of this program, we'll get to as many of your questions as we possibly can can. Also, um, in order for you to interact with us, you need to know our schedule. So on Mondays and Fridays, we have Bible study at 10 a.m. Tuesdays and Thursdays is at 6 p.m. And Wednesday morning is at 7 a.m. And that is all mountain time. So please calculate that out. Tune in while we're live so you can interact with us. Did you know you can also interact with us by becoming a partner of this ministry? So all this live content that we have coming out to you, it does cost money and you would get to be a part of all the fruit of all the lives that are being blessed through these uh, Bible studies and all the live content, you can be a part of it simply by giving or by becoming a partner. So you can go to awmi.net slash give or give us a call at 719-635-1111. And last but not least, we do have prayer ministers available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So no matter what time you're watching this, if you've just stumbled upon this program and you are in need of prayer, do not hesitate to give our prayer ministers a call at 719-635-1111. So those are all my announcements. Now I get to introduce our speaker today who is Pastor Rick McFarland. He is a um, instructor at Karis Bible College. He also is the pastor of River Rock Church in Colorado Springs. You can find out more information about River Rock by going to riverrockchurch.net and check it out. So Pastor Rick, we're excited that you're here and so I hand it to you. Sir. Amen. Always Amen. a fun time to be with you, especially yes. you, Julianne. Amen. And so I'm going to share a powerful word today that has helped me numerous times in my life. And so I think it was good to share it with you today. And so the title of this message is The Guarantee of Supernatural Peace. And I think we all want to have supernatural peace, but Amen. sometimes you think, well, you know what, uh, I've had peace in my life and there's been times I haven't had peace and just comes with circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know when I'm going to have the peace or not, but you can actually have a guarantee of supernatural peace anytime you want to experience it. And we're going to look at a couple of powerful verses that show us the guarantee of supernatural peace. So that's found in Philippians chapter four. Let's look at verse six and seven. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. So that, that's beyond your natural understanding. And so if you're going to have a peace that surpasses natural understanding, it's supernatural right. peace. Amen. And so you're going to have a peace of God that supernatural, super, <laughs> surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So here we see that if we'll follow what is told for us to do in verse 6, we're guaranteed to have the supernatural peace of God listed in verse 7, having the peace that passes all understanding guarding our hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. And so let's look at Philippians 4, 6 more clearly and look at there's three stipulations, three things we're called to do in this verse. And if we'll do all three, we're guaranteed to have supernatural peace. Amen. And so the first thing it says is it's, we are to be anxious for nothing. And so, uh, Julianne, I did a deep word study one time on the word nothing. Oh, really? And uh, found out it means nothing. Oh, wow. And so I did it <laughs> so for you guys and for the people. <laughs> and so I looked it up and it means nothing. Well, you think if I have marriage problems, I can't have a little worried about that. What if my kids seem to be going off the rails? I could be worried about them. No, no. It says be anxious for nothing. Amen. And so, first of all, so this first stipulation is that you need to cast your cares. <laughs> cast your cares over on the Lord. Look in 1 Peter 5, 7. Here's a sister verse to this. Amen. In 1 Peter 5, look at verse 7. 
It says, casting some of your care upon him. No. I'm sorry, clueless translation. <laughs> casting all of your care upon him, for he cares for you. I love the Amplified because it even gets worse. Oh, really? The, no, the wiggle room's taken out. <laughs> when you read the Amplified Classic in 1 Peter 5, look at verse 7. Again, in the Amplified Classic, it says, casting the whole of your care, mm. all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all, on Him, for He cares for you affectionately and cares for you watchfully. You know, many refuse to get rid of their worries and their cares because if they think, well, if I don't care for them and I don't make sure that they're taken care of, well, who will care for them? Right. Well, if you'll cast them over on the Lord, you're going to find out the Lord cares for you. you and the Lord loves you more than you love you, and you love some you. But the <laughs> Lord loves you more. And he, he knows how to take care of you. And, and if you love someone, if you love children, you're going to protect them. You're going to provide for them. Well, how much more is the Lord going to do that for you? And so we need to cast our cares over on the Lord because he cares yeah. for us. And so here it says, be anxious for nothing. And so a lot of times we think, well, Lord, are you telling me to stop trying to think about my problem? Paul, are you trying to say to stop thinking about the problem you have? And so he's not saying that. Because it's impossible to stop thinking something. Mm -hmm. But the more you try to stop thinking something, you think about it. Yeah. And for instance, Julian, I'm going to I'm going to prove this with you. I want you to, to stop thinking about the pink elephant. Oh. No pink. <laughs> stop, no elephant. Either. Okay. No. Nope. No pink. Okay. Stop thinking the elephant. Okay. <laughs> You're thinking she's all the pink elephants just dominating her mind. Well, the only way she can get free from the pink elephant is to think on the blue gorilla. Oh, wow. That means that you can't just stop something. You need to totally replace it with another thought. Yeah, that's good. And so this verse says, don't be anxious for, for, not be anxious for nothing. But it didn't stop there. He keeps saying, but what do you do with those cares and worries? But in everything by prayer and supplication mm -hmm. with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And so you need to get your mind over on the Lord and you need to cast your cares over on Him and start thinking about the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so... What do you need to do with your cares? You need to turn your cares into prayers. Mm. Turn your cares into prayers. And so you need to be serious with this. It says casting all of your care upon him. The word casting is not a fishing term. Oh, it's not? You know, with the, where the rod and reel and you, yeah, you throw what it out. It what do you do when you, when you throw you out? You reel, you reel it in. It. Don't reel your problems <laughs> back in. This is not a fishing term. This is a WWE term. Oh, wow. A professional wrestling term. Actually, wow. in the Greek, it's a, very, it's a very violent word. It means to slam. Oh, no. Really? It means slam your cares over on the Lord. Well, you need to be forceful with worries. Why? Because they're sticky creatures. Yeah, they are. Have you ever been in, you went into the throne room and you prayed over something and you thought you gave it over on God and you came out and, and you still have it. You still have the word. <laughs> yes. It's like fly paper on your shoe or a tissue on your shoe. You can't seem to get rid of it. And so that's the way you had to be forceful with that. And you need to take worry as serious as sin because it is sin. Oh, well, Pastor, where does it say that it's sin? Well, look at Romans 14. Look at verse 23. We're going to find out that worry is sin. <clears throat> Romans 14. Look at verse 23. It says, But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is what? Sin. Last time I checked, I've never been able to worry in faith. Amen. <laughs> Lord, I'm going to trust you with this worry. <laughs> no, every time you've worried, you have not been in faith. And whatever is not of faith is sin. It's, it's serious. Sometimes, oh, I'm just a worry word. I'm just a world champion worrier, and you laugh about it. Yeah. But no, it's actually sin, and so you need to take it serious. You need to get firm with that. And I refuse to have that worry. When I go to the Lord, I'm going to body slam it over on the Lord. He can take it, and it's going to, I'm going to leave it with Him. And so it reminds me of a story of Smith Wigglesworth. Okay. And so Smith Wigglesworth was getting on a train, and oh, no, actually he was about to get on a train, but he saw a, a, a lady getting on the train before him, though. And a little dog was falling. Her little dog was following her along mm -hmm. uh, from home, and and she said, "No, sweetheart, you can't get on that train. That train's not for you. You can't, sweetie." <laughs> and that little dog was just, you know, the tail was wagging, and yeah. it got closer and closer for her having to go. And finally, she said, "Get." Amen. And that dog 
whoop, and she took off. And, and Wigglesworth said, that's what you got to do with the devil. Amen. That's what you got to do with worry. You got to do with, with uh, that worry in your life. You have to be serious with it and say, you know what? I am not going to tolerate worry in my life. I'm going to get it over on the Lord and keep it there. And so God has given you free will and sovereignty over what you think on. And so the Lord's not going to make you change what you think on. It's up to you what you think on. And so let me tell you something. If you have your problem, the Lord does not. Mm. If the Lord does not have your problem, you have the problem. Or if you have the problem, He does not have your problem. He is not into care sharing. Care sharing. He's not going to take half of the care and you take half the care. It's either <laughs> cast the whole of your care or none of your care. And so again, if you have your, if you're worrying right now, the Lord doesn't have it. He can't do anything with it because he's given you authority on earth and he's not going to violate your free will. And so what do you need to do? You need to forcefully just throw it over on the Lord and leave it there. And what happens when the devil, because you know the devil's going to come back to try to remind you yeah. about the problem. And so if the devil comes back to you, what do you tell, what do you tell the devil? Devil, if you want to talk about that problem, you need to go talk to God because he's the one that has it. Amen. And the last time the devil was up in the throne room, trouble happened. Amen. He is not excited about going there again. Amen. And so he will be running from you. And so again, tell the devil, you don't have that problem. Go talk to God about it. And so you need to see something. Worry is always based on fear. Mm -hmm. That's the opposite of faith. Worry is based in fear. Fear always involves torment. We see that in 1 John 4, 18, because it says that fear involves torment. <clears throat> There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in the love of God. And so when you are focusing on your problem, you're not focusing on God's love for you. Yeah, so true. You can't focus on God's love for you and focus on your problem at the same time. Because if you focused on the love of God, it would cast out fear. Amen. And so worry is based in fear. Amen. So casting your, care and ex uh, casting your care and experiencing supernatural peace will actually lead, the, lead you to be able to hear from the Holy Spirit about your problem. Because there's some things that you're going to have to physically do about your problem. It's not like you just cast it over on the God and He takes care of everything. Oftentimes there's something He's asking you to do, but when you're in fear and worry, you're not open to get divine wisdom. No. You're not open for God to lead you. But once you get into a place of faith, get in a place of peace, that's when the Holy Spirit can show you what to do about your problem. Amen. And this brings out a story when I was in Bible school, my first Bible school right out of college that God called me to. Uh, it was the first time that I was on my own dime. My parents, praise God for my mom and dad, they paid for my college and my room and board there at college. But once I graduated and I told them, you know what, I'm going to go to Bible school. I don't think they were overly excited about me not working, but going to another school. And they said, well, that's all on you. Okay. You'll have to pay for that. And so I was at, have my own apartment. I had my own insurance, my own car payment, all the stuff. And I got into worrying about making tuition. And I was so worried about it. One day the Lord spoke to me and says, I can't provide provision if you're in worry. Oh, wow. And so cast it over on me. And I cast that over on him. And it wasn't, it was that day, but that night I had a dream. I haven't had many dreams where actually I woke up knowing what the Lord was saying to me. Yeah. But I was on an airplane flying and there was this little girl, she must have been five, six years old. Okay. And she was a seat in front of me. Well, she hopped up and turned around and she pointed right at me and pointed her, put her finger right on my nose and said, you must give to receive. Mm -hmm. I, actually, what I had made a decision on is I was going to pull back on my giving. Ah. To make sure I took care of myself. I right. wasn't going to tithe. I was going to, that's the dumbest thing you can do Amen. as a farmer. Boy, I have famine. I'm not going to sow as much seed. Right. And so what happened was, is uh, I woke up, I knew exactly what the Lord's saying. He said, and I'm not going to give, cut back on my giving. I'm going to increase my giving. Amen. And every single time he met me with tuition. Praise God. And so again, when you cast your worry over the Lord, you open yourself up to the actual wisdom and direction of God. And so I have actually a story about my mother. And so my mother called me one day, she was crying. Mm -hmm. And so I said, mom, you're going to have to stop crying for me to understand what you're saying. And she said, well, son, uh, we had some layoffs at my job. I didn't know that, but she said uh, we had a large layoff and they laid off some people off. And, 
and I made the cut on that. I didn't get laid off, but then rumors were having it. There was another big layoff coming up in a week or so, and so she was just so worried about that, and one day she, she's driving home, has a splitting headache. Her neck's all tense and sore, and she has a splitting headache, and she's just driving along, and finally she said, Lord, I can't take this anymore. You take it. And as soon as she said, Lord, you take it, her, the, she turned her neck and it, it didn't hurt her neck. Wow. And all of a sudden the headache was gone. Praise God. And then all, as soon as she realized the headache was gone, she said there was a tingling in her spirit. It was a spiritual thing. It was in, her, in the pit of her stomach. It just rose up and then went through her top of her head and supernatural peace Praise came God. over her. She, she, she experienced what, because she gave her care over on the Lord Amen. and experienced supernatural peace so she didn't That's lose God. her job. Yeah. So praise That's God. Awesome. So, so we need to turn our cares into prayers. We need to get them over on the Lord, cast our care. But the next thing it says is we are to pray specifically. We are to uh, let the Lord know by prayer and supplication. Look at the word supplication. Uh, the Greek word for supplication is a Greek word that means definite requests, definite requests. And so let your definite requests be known. Look at Mark 11, look at verse 24. It says, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe you receive them and you will have them. Often we're too vague in prayer. Yeah. And so we think if we're really vague, then anything that gets answered, it was God, you know, <laughs> because if, we, if we're too specific, then God can't pull it off, right? We'll look back. chance of it. No, no, you need to be very specific with the Lord. I'm going to look at a couple of verses where the Lord, matter of fact, made somebody be specific with what they wanted. Mm. It was too vague. Yeah. Uh, Matthew 20, there's some blind men uh, one day were crying out to Jesus. Yeah. In Matthew 20, look at verse 30. Matthew 20, verse 30 says, And behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet, but they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. So Jesus stood still and called to them. And so they, they were walking, they led him up there, and so obviously they're blind. Mm -hmm. And Jesus has the audacity to say to the blind men, What do you want me to do for you? Yeah. He wanted to hear from them their specific prayer request. Right. It'd be amazing as a pastor, you have someone come up for prayer and you just know that that's what they're coming up for. And it's totally something opposite. Yeah. And so again, Jesus said, what do you want me to do? What specifically th thing are you asking from me? One day, James and John came to Jesus and wanting to sit on his right hand and his left yes. hand. And Mark chapter 10, look at verse 35. Mark 10, 35. It says, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus saying, teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask. Sounds like a four or five year old. Mommy, can you, will you do anything I want? <laughs> no. What do you want? Well, look at verse 36. Jesus said to them, what do you want me to do for you? He wanted them to be specific. Specific, yeah. And so they were being vague and Jesus said, no, specifically, what do you want me to do? And this brings out a point where I was learning faith in the first Bible school I went to about walking in faith that Lord, that you can use your faith on purpose, not when you're in a problem and to exercise your faith. The just shall live by faith, Amen. not make it through a trouble through faith. Right. And so I knew that, that, uh, that faith is specific. And so uh, I had a roommate and they went to the same school I did. And so I, I talked to said, let's practice using our faith. Mm -hmm. And so I said, what is a need that we have? Let's look around for a need that we have and believe God for it, actively believe God for it. So we looked around the room and I looked over and I saw by the, by the door, mm -hmm. there was just, it was open. There wasn't a chair there and we'd have Bible studies and invariably we'd have someone just sit on the floor okay. over there. And so we said, you know what? We need a chair over there. We need, a, and so I told my roommate, I said, let's believe for a faith chair. A faith it's chair. Believe God. And so, uh, so I, I asked him, what do you want in a chair? And I, I don't remember what he said, but I know I re still remember what I asked Okay, for. what did you ask for? I wanted a swiveler. A swiveler. Like Ooh. this chair I'm in right now is a swiveler. A swiveler. So I could talk to you and then I could talk to you and I wanted a swiveler. <laughs> okay. And so we, uh, we can't, so okay, we're going to believe that we, we're going to ask, believe we receive when we pray. Yeah. And, and we're not going to get out of agreement. We're right. going to thank God for after that, that for he's done it. the swiveler chair. For the swiveler chair. And, and so we prayed in the swiveler in Jesus' name. And so we prayed. 
and uh, and we thank the Lord. And so uh, I would actually walk around that area for the next couple of days. Know my chair's there, right? So I'm walking around, and so it was like two days. But I came home from school, opened the door, and there sat a chair. No way. I asked the roommate. Room, I said, "What happened with this chair?" Because we didn't tell anybody our need. Right. Because you're in your faith, you don't need a hint of other people. I know, right? And help God out. <laughs> exactly. And so, but there was a chair there, and I asked my room, Mike, "What happened with this with the chair?" And he goes, "Well, the the landlord said they had an extra chair, and they just brought it in <laughs> and set it down." And I was rejoicing. I was sitting in this chair, and all of a sudden, I said, "Wait a minute! Uh uh-uh. uh It's not a swiveler." And I got up and said, I refuse to sit in an Ishmael. Oh. This is an Ishmael chair. <laughs> and the part of my thought was like, well, you need to be thankful for oh, what well, you yeah, get. Yeah, you got a chair. Yeah, you got a chair. But no, no, that's not what I asked for. Mm. And we specifically asked for a swimmer. I said, take it back. Tell them I don't want it. And the next, so, so we went, and the next day I went to school. And the next day I am before the Lord. I walk in and there is another chair and it was a swiveler. Wow. Praise God. The Lord's big enough to handle your prayer requests. <laughs> so be specific in your prayer. <laughs> yes. The th- okay. third thing is we're to add thanksgiving to our prayer. Yay. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Amen. Look at, look at thanksgiving. Th- thanksgiving is basically your sign of faith. When you believe some, someone has done something for you, what do you say to them? Thank you. Thank you. You should. So thank you is a sign of faith that you did something. And so when you prayed in faith and you gave it over to the Lord and you believe he's done it, you say thank you. That's the release of faith. And so thanksgiving is the will of God for you. Walking in faith is the will of God for you. But thanksgiving is the sign that you're in faith. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, look at verse 18. This is one of the three verses, Julianne, in the whole New Testament that specifically says this is the will of God. Amen. This is one of the only three places you find it. And here it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks. Thanks. Because he wants you in faith about everything. Yeah. In everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so we're to be thankful to the Lord, but we can only thank someone for what they've done. Yeah. And so when he says everything, that's everything the Lord's done. It's not thankful for what the devil's done. You're not going to be thankful for cancer. You're not going to be thankful for the things he's doing. But you can thank God for everything he's done. And so, again, you can be in the geographic will of God and be out of the spiritual will of God. Amen. You can be right where God told you to be geographically and be filled with negativity and gripe and grumble and complain, and you're out of the will of God. And so this gives an example. One day I was on my bed and I was having a pity party. Uh Uh-oh. Yes, I I sent all my invitations out and a few demons showed up. (laughs) And I was grumbling, griping about something. I forget what it was. I was on my bed, not happy. And my wife, my sweet wife, you know Joanne. Yes. Far the far better hole. (laughs) And so she was putting, getting her makeup put on or something over at the lavatory. And I was on my bed, grumbling, griping, complaining. And and my sweet wife said, "Sweetheart, you don't sound very thankful." Yeah, what's it to you? <laughs> she says, no, sweetheart, you're not thankful. You need to be thankful. Get Right now, you need to give me three things you're thankful for. Mm-hmm. You ever had someone do that when yeah. the last thing you want to do is do that? Yes. I said, no. no. She goes, yes, sweetheart. I said, no. <laughs> yes, you need to, honey. No. Do you want to eat? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, so I got real spiritual, and I said, well, thank you for the air I'm breathing. Thank Ooh. you for this bed I'm laying on. She goes, honey, that's not being thankful. Three more things. It's like, I better get with this because this is not going anywhere. <laughs> or you're not so I started eat. getting spirit. I said, Lord, I thank you for that. I'm not going to hell. Hey, That's a big thing. I'm is. going to heaven and I thank you for righteous. She said, keep going, sweetheart. You're doing good. <laughs> so I kept doing And, I, and I, as I was thanking the Lord for everything he's done for me and everything, all of a sudden, the presence of God, that, yes. that heaviness lifted, Hallelujah. the presence of God came into that room and I started crying. Amen. And at some point, Joanne left the room in the glory cloud. Praise God. And the Lord showed me that thanksgiving is a key to the presence of God. Praise God. Thanksgiving is so a key good. to the anointing and presence of God. Amen. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, look at verse 17. When you start praying in the Spirit, the Spirit's going to lead you automatically to start thanking God. Because uh, we're going to find out in 1 Corinthians 14, 17, it says, when you pray in tongues, you give thanks well. Amen. Why would the Holy Spirit lead you to, get, to start thanking God when you start praying in tongues? Because it's divine protocol of the presence of God. Amen. Well, where do you find that? That's in Psalms 100. Look at verse 4. <laughs> what is the divine protocol to entering God's presence? Psalms 100, 
Look at verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Divine protocol of the presence of God. You want the presence of God? Start thanking God. What do you need in your problem, in the situation with the problem? You need the anointing because the anointing breaks the yoke. Amen. The presence of God is what's going to make a difference. First of all, it's going to make a difference in you, and then outwardly it'll make a difference in your problem. And so sometimes we don't know exactly what to pray as we ought, and the Holy Spirit helps us when we pray in tongues. Do you know, Julianne, when you start praying in tongues, automatically the Holy Spirit helps you fulfill all of verse 6 of Philippians 4? Amen. Because it says by prayer. The word for prayer is the Greek word prosuke. Okay. And so look at 1 Corinthians 14, 15. This is talking about praying in tongues. It says, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit. That's praying in tongues. Amen. Look at the word pray. It's prosuke. Hmm? The same Greek word is by prayer and supplication in nice. verse 6 of Philippians. But it, notice it says, with supplications. And so look at Ephesians 6, look at verse 18. Ephesians 6, look at verse 18. It says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit supplication in the Spirit. And so there's times when you can get into actual supplications. So when you first part, start praying in tongues, you will start praising and thanking God. Mm -hmm. That's the protocol of the God's presence. But if you'll pray in tongues longer, you'll actually enter into the deeper realms of tongues and you get into supplications. Amen. That's when your prayer language changes. Yeah. And into some foreign language, you're like, oh, business is being transacted. <laughs> and so, so when you pray in tongues, uh, after a good amount of time, you enter into supplications in this, it's the same Greek word. So good. Definite requests. So good. And then it says in 1 Corinthians again, 14, 17, when you pray in tongues, you give thanks well. Mm -hmm. So all three parts. I have not ever gone an entire hour of praying in tongues that I didn't walk away with supernatural peace. For real. On the inside of me and over me. So true. And so when you'll do verse six, you refuse to have anxiety, refuse to be troubled, you throw that over on the Lord and you specifically pray, Lord, I'm asking you to do this. I'm needing this. And you thank the Lord for taking it. Every time you're going to get verse seven and the peace of God that surpasses all natural understanding. Have you had, have you ever been in a situation where you've prayed and you've, and you've given something over the Lord and you have supernatural peace mm -hmm. that you shouldn't naturally, you shouldn't have that peace because your problem didn't change. Yeah. That's still there, but you change. Yes. And all of a sudden you have such a peace and your brain's freaking out. I should be worried, but I'm not. Yeah. Amen. And that's where you're at when you have that super, it passes all natural understanding. It guards your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. That's called the supernatural peace of God. And so you can have that. It's guaranteed to you. If you don't have supernatural peace right now, it's because you haven't done verse six. You need to go back to Philippians 4, 6. Am I anxious over that? Do I still have that problem? Have I fully cast the whole of my care over on Him? Have I specifically asked Him what I'm needing? And am I thanked Him? Am I in faith? And have I left it there with Him? Because if you've done that, you're going to have the byproduct, a guaranteed supernatural <laughs> peace flood over your being even though your situation changed. So you just have to change what's happening on the inside of you before it can change what's going on the outside of you. Amen. And so what are you going to do? There's a key that we're going to end this that you need to stay in peace because you can get that immediately after prayer, have that supernatural peace, but you're going to have an opportunity to lose it because mm. the devil again is going to come back to you or Sister Bucket Mouth or Brother Flip a Lip. Yes. Or your problem, you're going to have to face that again. You're going to go to work and fix your boss, and, yeah. and you're going to have a tendency to lose that peace. But how do you keep that peace? I'm glad you asked. Look at the next verse, verse 8, Philippians 4 8. This is how you keep that supernatural peace. Philippians 4 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatever things that are true, whatever things that are noble, whatever things that are just, Whatever things that are pure, whatever things that are lovely, whatever things that that whatever things that are of a good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these th these things. So you have eight filters that your thoughts need to go through. Amen. And so thoughts come to us, but if they don't pass the true test, well, it's true, Pastor. But is it noble? Is it pure? Is it lovely? 
And so there's eight filters, and the only thing that can make it through the eight filters in Philippians 4, 8 is the Word of God. Amen. It's, it's Jesus. Basically, Jesus and everything that belongs to Jesus is the only thing that can make it through those. You need a bouncer at your door of your mind. Amen. And so, again, so you need to cast out anything that doesn't pass this test. But notice something. I, I quoted some words, or I said some words with emphasis, are true, are noble, are just, are pure, are lovely, are of a good report, is a virtue, is praiseworthy. Why would I bring that out? Because worry is always based on the future, what may or may not happen. Mm -hmm. What if? Often, yeah, what if. Yeah. So it's always future, what may happen, yeah. may not, it may not ever happen. Oftentimes it never happens. Yeah. But, but, so what do you need to focus on? What things are true? Right now. Right now, what is true? Amen. The Word of God. Amen. What is true about your God? He's faithful. Amen. What is true? The Word of God says, my God shall supply all my need according to riches and glory by Amen. Christ. By His stripes I am healed. I can go back to what I know is true. And so don't focus on what may or may not be true in the future. Focus on what is true. Go back to the Word. And so Philippians 4, 8, that reminds me the, of, a, of a, a commercial when I was growing up, and I'm dating myself. Uh, <laughs> But they used to have a commercial for V8 vegetable juice. Yes, I remember. And so V8, and so you'd have this person all run down, and he was like, <laughs> man, and he was just having a bad day. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden he would go, I should have had a V8. V8. <laughs> And so I see so many Christians that like they're all worn down, they're, they're negative, they're yeah. sad or whatever. You know what? They need to go, I should have had a 4 8. <laughs> a Philippians 4 8. Amen. You need a Philippians 4 8. Amen. Because you need to start thinking on the things that are true, the things that are noble, things that are just, yes. things that are pure, things that are lovely, and things that are of a good report. If there's any virtue, if there's any praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And you'll keep the soldiers at peace at their post. Because it says that the peace of God will guard your heart and mind. In the Greek, that means a soldier, soldiers garrisoning around, putting a garrison yeah. around your heart and mind. And so, how do you get, keep the soldiers of peace at their post once you had those? It's Philippians 4 8. And so, again, I'm not saying that it is not challenging to do, control your thought life. But you have the helper, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, please help me. When I'm starting to focus on the wrong thing, bring, bring this back to my mind. What is true? That, I, that I'm in sin, that I'm not trusting you. I need to keep, keep that over on the Lord. The Holy Spirit will help you do that every single day. So, in, conclu in conclusion, closing, there's power in prayer. There's supernatural peace guaranteed to you if you will do what's told you to do in Philippians 4, 6. You get verse 7 every single time. Amen. But what, what does Philippians 4, 6 says to do? You need to cast your care, the whole of your care, once and for all, over on the Lord, and then leave it there with Him. And, and so next to all, you need to be specific in prayer with the Lord. Specifically, what are you needing and then you need to add thanksgiving, the thanksgiving of faith, that he's got it. And then keep the soldiers at peace at their post with Philippians 4, 8. So let me pray. Father, I thank you for those that are listening right now, Lord. Father, they have problems. They have financial problems. They have marital problems. They have problems at work. But Lord, they are to be anxious for nothing. Amen. And Lord, because you care for them and you want to take care of them because if they have their problem, you do not. And so, Lord, I pray by the Holy Spirit they would show them and convict them of the sin of being out of faith, Lord, that they're going to get out, get into faith by casting all of their care over on you right now. And so, right now, I'm asking you right now to see the Lord, you walking up with that, whatever that worry is, whatever that care is, and I want you to see you throwing that over on the Lord and let Him take that, see Him take that, and then I want you to say thank you for that and walk away, walk away. And Lord, I thank you, Father, that when they do that supernatural peace, I speak peace over you in the name of Jesus. Amen. And Father, the things are going to change on the inside of them before on the outside. Yes. And now they're in a place, Lord, I ask you to speak to them. Give them divine wisdom. Give them revelation yes. about what, if there's anything they need to do, Lord, in the place of peace, they can hear your voice. Mm -hmm. That you'll speak that divine wisdom right now. It's released to them. And Lord, they're going to act on that. They're going to see a victory in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for it. Amen. Amen. Man, that's so powerful. You know, there's so much freedom when you find change 
in the midst of your circumstances. Yeah. Because then it doesn't matter what the circumstances, because the circumstances are always going to go up and down. Yeah. And if you haven't had bad circumstances, just live a little longer, right? Yeah. <laughs> but when you finally realize and get in that place of peace, in spite of the circumstances, that's yeah. true freedom. That's liberty. Yeah, I think as we all want to be like the disciples of Jesus and have Jesus super right. so calm, calm the storm. storm. <laughs> but no, exactly. but no. Usually, in no. The, on this side of it, the Lord wants to calm His child. Amen. Amen. And then, yes, and then basically, it's your authority. Yeah. You know, He's given us authority over the natural. We're to speak to the wind. Because, you know, they woke Jesus up and Jesus says, why are you so fearful? Why haven't you done something yeah. with this? Why I gave you the word to go into the other side, yeah. but you want me to do something with it. Yeah. And so, first of all, you need to have, God's child has to be at calm and at peace. And then you can take authority over the enemy that's causing your problem. Amen. Man, that's good. Okay, let's get to your questions. You guys have submitted quite a few of them, so uh, let's get right into it. So, uh, to me on chat says, how do you have supernatural peace when stepping out in faith towards God's will, but everything seems to be coming against you, even family members you love and want their approval? Well, you need to keep your eyes off the circumstances. Amen. When all the lights go out in your life. <laughs> And electricity goes out in your life. Don't you don't focus on that. You focus on the light. You focus on the word of God. And so the truth of the word of God is where you need to keep your focus because the word never changes. Yes. Have you ever noticed that? No matter if your finances are going south or your health situation, the Bible still reads the same. Amen. That's By it. his stripes you were healed. My God shall supply Amen. all of his need. God's truth never changes. The realm of the natural is the place of facts. Facts change, but truth never changes. Facts will never change the truth, but the truth will change the facts. We don't deny the facts of the natural. We right. deny the facts ability to stay there and be the last word. Amen. We let the truth of the Word of God be the last word, yes. and that's what we look at. Amen. So good. So good. Uh, Jean on chat says, what if we trust God and cast our cares on Him, but we are praying for someone who needs God's protection, but they don't know Him? Well, then that's a whole nother thing. One is praying for your own needs yeah. versus interceding for someone else. You can't violate someone's will. That's it. And so the thing you can do, you can take authority over the spirits trying to speak lies to them, mm -hmm. take authority over the yeah. spirits, and then ask for laborers to come across with the truth that the Word of God would get to them. But ultimately, it's up to them to decide to receive it or not. You can't make someone receive the truth. And so, but you can take your spiritual authority over the devil, mm -hmm. and you can pray for, Jesus said, pray for laborers for the harvest field, pray for labors, or God may have used you mm -hmm. to sow that word to them, but obviously it's up to them to believe. Amen. Amen. And so, then the lights will come on. And Praise then God. the lights come back on. Yeah. <laughs> UP on YouTube says, uh, what does the Bible mean when we're told to labor into his rest? Oh, that's a great question. It yeah. looks like that's an oxymoron, right? It Labored in like rest. That's a moronic ox. <laughs> So oxymoron. No, labor into rest. You know, with our labor as the Christian life is to enter into faith. Yeah. Because we have enemies to our faith. We have the devil that's constantly fighting and trying to uh, cause circumstances look opposite than what, what the Word of God says. And we have the flesh, and the flesh is always on our senses. And then we have other people that's coming against us. And so there's things that oppose us. And so we have to actually labor to enter into a place of rest. And so what's that? What's the main labor? Stay in the Word. Meditate the Word day and night. Stay in that Word. Pump that Word in our heart. And so that's the labor of, of staying in the Word. So that those are worthy of double honor that labor in the Word and doctrine. Yeah. And so our labor is just to stay in that Word, meditate that Word, Be a, there's labor in prayer. Yeah. And so that's just getting to a place of the supernatural peace because the highest form of faith is not a Jericho march. Amen. The highest form of faith is not shouting and, and jumping around and right. pacing. No, the, the, the greatest form of faith is when you're at rest. Yes. And you're at peace. Yes. And so, again, uh, you, you, you labor to enter into a place of resting where you're trusting in God's Word. And so, again, you're not trying to change the situation, not really fighting the devil. You're really laboring to get into the Word and actually get in your heart the, where your confidence is in what the Word says. Amen. And I would say, too, and maybe you can uh, clarify, but it seems like the labor gets easier the longer you do it. 
Meaning, as you go through battle after battle after battle, and you've labored and you've found that place of rest, yeah. then that becomes your default. Yeah. And then it's just kind of like working out, right? Like your yeah. muscle gets stronger into where when something comes at you, that labor isn't so laborious. As you grow in faith, it takes more and more to get you in to get you in unrest. out of the rest. Out right? of the rest, it takes yeah. it takes a bigger thing and a greater thing. New level, new devil. Mm. And so the devil can't trick you at this stage here, but you, so what used to throw you just totally. It doesn't even. It doesn't even bother you anymore. Right. And so he has to do something else. And so the devil's always going to be there and new level, new devil, but you get to a place to where God's come through so many times. That's you have it. such confidence in him right. and you know that he's going to take care of it. And you know the devil's a loser. He's, he's kind of like that wily coyote. <laughs> exactly. And the road runner. He's always, always trying to be. do something. He's always got the Acme Amen. dynamite and he blows himself <laughs> up and he falls down the deal. And, and so Amen. after a while you realize you just laugh at him because you realize, oh, that's a good, that's not even a good try devil. Right, right. <laughs> You're pathetic. Uh, but, <laughs> but you keep your eyes on him and you'll see wily coyote take a face plant. Amen. That's it. So, so good. Uh, to me. Yeah. By faith. On YouTube <laughs> says, how can I draw a line between being passive and casting all my cares on the God? Really well, good. well, actually you can't be passive with worry and doubt. And, 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 uh, cause, cause if, well, I think he's meaning if you're passive, you're just kind of like, Oh, I'll just ignore it. Yeah. What's, how do you draw the line between that and casting your care upon God. Well, casting your care on God isn't being passive. That's actually being being proactive. Amen. And you actively, by faith, you're going to have slam to get it. that, slam like that, that over on Him and get that, be proactive and active with that. That's active faith. And so then actually your resting in faith is actually something that's not overly passive yourself. It's what God's doing then. And so again, we're too passive as Christians. We let the devil come in and he's a thief that comes in to steal, kill, and destroy. Amen. So notice it says he comes to steal, kill, and then finally total destruction. Yeah. And so he comes to steal first. And so the devil will come in and he'll try something small. Yeah. See what he can get away with. Right. And often we're passive and we just let him do it. Like we start out with a sniffle. That's a sniffle and just get extra Kleenex or whatever. <laughs> But we just don't, we don't resist him. Oh, no. and, and so, uh, and then he comes back with more and he comes back yeah. with more. And then he's stealing, finally, he's, he's taking our refrigerator out the door. That's when we say, hey, not the refrigerator. No, not the fridge. Not the TV. Uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so, and now you get in the battle. No, you need to, you need right. to, you need to stand against the devil at the onset. Amen. It's much so easier good. to meet him at the front door than in your bedroom. Amen. And so again, it's proactive. You have to stand to get, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Amen. And so again, faith is always going to be aggressive, not something that's real passive. Amen. Um, so Glade on YouTube says, can we just ask anything from the Lord? Sometimes I feel so hesitant to ask the Lord for specific things because I feel like I am controlling God or treating him like a genie. Well, if you found out someone left you an inheritance, and you came to claim your inheritance. Are you being greedy? Yeah. Oh, you little greeter. No, this was the, that, that was the will of the person that left and died. <laughs> left. That was exactly. their will for me to have it. Amen. It's not greedy. It's not selfish. Amen. And so how do we know what God's will is for us? This was in his last will and testament. What did he leave? He left healing. He left prosperity. He left, there's nothing good that he left out of the inheritance. Just find out what did he leave you? That's his will for you to have. Jesus said, whatever you ask the father in my name, mm -hmm. whatever you ask in the name of Jesus, that's according to his will, his character and what he left you in his will when he mm -hmm. died. Right. And so when you ask according to his will, we know he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we know we have the petitions. Amen. So God actually delights it when you receive from him and come and get what's in your will and actually appropriate it and what he died for. It honors him. It actually dishonors the Lord. We say, oh, well, I don't want to bother the Lord. Right. It's too much. No, that's pride. That's pride. I've come all the way from Colorado Springs to tell you, get out of pride. <laughs> Humble yourself <laughs> and receive what he wants from you. Amen. But isn't that how we do it? Like, I remember back in the day before I learned all these truths that it'd be like my bill was $80. And, and then you start bartering with Yeah, God, I might right? take 40 You're I can like, handle the 40 Yeah, because I do have, you know, I could yeah. cash this in and I could cash. If you could just give me 60 God, 
then then I could make this work, right? That's and Ashley so wants crazy. to give you 160. Right. So that's 80 so that for you, you and someone else. Somebody bill. else. And so let's finish with this uh, question. Okay. This will be a great round out. Uh, Funto on YouTube says, "Can the Lord give more than you requested for, even after asking specifically?" Absolutely. Yay. God is able to give abundantly above what we ask or think. Think or imagine. Isn't above that amazing? Above what we even think or imagine. He's able to give exceedingly abundant above what we ask oh, or even imagine. So God loves to be, he's more, he's the God of more than enough. Amen. He's El Shaddai, not El Chipo. Amen. And so God is a God of abundance and he loves to, to super abound more than what we'd ever need. Why would he want to bless us with more than we could ever need? So we can give it. Amen. Well, Lord, just bless me and my three. Well, you prideful, stingy person. No, I should have more in my life so I can give to those people. I can't give something I don't have. Amen. And so again, God wants you to have super abundance so that you can be a super giver. Amen. My mom was just telling me this week, God's, he's an extravagant God. Yes, he is. Isn't that a great word? Yeah, everything uh, he's done, he's, how many flowers do you make? He didn't I make know, one right? kind. Like how he many flowers do you need? Hundred thousands. Yeah. And, right. And, and on, <laughs> it, he's, a, he's a God of abundance. You're not going to tap God out. Amen. Praise God. Well, we've come down to an end of our time together and we just want to thank you for tuning in today. Thank you, Pastor Rick. This was awesome. Thank you for having me. Amen. You're welcome. And so you guys have an amazing peace filled weekend in spite of your circumstances. Don't forget to tune in on Monday at 10 a.m. for another live Bible study. And uh, have a great weekend, Pastor. You too. All right, I will. Bless you guys you. too. See you next time. Bye. You know, my whole ministry is just about encouraging people to take the seed of God's Word and let it work in your heart. And of course, we do that through television, through materials that we put out. But the greatest way we have of impacting anybody is our Caris Bible College. I tell you, it is discipleship on steroids. We see people come in one way and leave a different way. I promise you that this could change your life. So check out our Caris Bible College with many locations around the world. We are now enrolling for fall and spring semesters. Find out more about the Caris experience. Call 719-635-1111. Caris Bible College, change your life, change the world. Join us every weekday for our daily live stream on Gospel Truth TV.